time. Uh, if you will, bow with me for a word of prayer, before we start. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for giving us another nice day, Lord. And, and uh, thank you for giving us a day that you never promised us. Lord, we want to ask you to uh, bless this city, bless the people in this room, and be with the sick and the shut in. And for the upcoming season, Lord, we want to ask you to bless our men and women who fight for our freedom, have fought and still are fighting. Thank you for them with us. Not ever forget them. We want to ask you to bless America. And lead us out each day to be your will. For in Jesus' name we pray. Okay. Public hearing on rezoning 215 Faulkner Way. Anybody here concerning 215 Faulkner Way? Don't say it out here. I've got some things going on out and stuff. I'll be quick. I, I've got to get to the NA next meeting that's starting right now. Uh, in regard to the property 215 Faulkner Way that uh, was approved last month in the planning and zoning board, I just had a, qu uh, a couple of uh, concerns that I wanted to put out there. I would like to start by saying that uh, the concept of the idea is something that I am for. And I think that it could be a very good project if done right. But uh, my questions and concerns are mainly about whether or not uh, it is feasible in the particular location, whether the, the concept or the idea is, is a good idea or not. The location needs to be something that's suitable for it, as well as if it is deemed to be suitable uh, as far as the location for that concept, and I'll choose to move forward with that concept. Again, I, I'm all for that type of uh, concept and trying to um, restructure or remodel older houses and things for better use, but I would just like to see that if it's something they could do, they, they have all their, um, everything that they need approvals for taken care of on the front of them so that it's not something that's drugged out. But my questions and concerns would be, and, and again, I'm just going to list these off and then leave you all to discuss because I, I need to get to this next meeting, but I did want to voice my concerns. Uh, number one being the current state of the residence that's up for considera consideration specifically concerns as to the feasibility of the existing structure to be used as the structural platform for the remainder of cosmetic work to be done. Um, by my uh, just glance in, in driving by the property, the property is in the state that I would consider to be a uh, condemnable state. Uh, I believe the property owner is aware of that uh, as well as um, the, the um, building inspector as well. Um, I guess my question and concern would be is it to the point where the existing structure is too far gone to where even with remodeling activities going on that the integrity of the actual structure itself is too far gone to be saved without going into an extraordinary amount of money to be able to make sure that it was a safe structure to live in. Uh, the second would be the current reality of the existing setbacks from all four property lines and their nonconformity to existing R2 setbacks as well as uh, their nonconformity to the R3. Again, uh, this is a concept that I don't really have any issues with, but uh, currently, uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't meet the side setbacks, the front setback, or the rear setback in R2. R3 is a little different in setback requirements, so it may be to where one of those uh, works for R3, but um, I would just, because of the proximity to the road, especially on uh, the side here, so the train tracks, um, it is very close to the road, and I just think that it's something that needs to be considered whether or not it is, uh, we know it's over the setback, but whether or not it's going to interfere uh, with any future utility improvements or anything else like that that the street might have to do on the street. Uh, number three will be the lack of off-street parking currently available and the lack of parking area available for future use of more than two vehicles. Um, I was at the board uh, at the planning and zoning meeting and there is a particular portion of the property that is not covered by structure that 
uh, looks to be able to fit at least two cars, possibly three. Um, that kind of plays into um, number uh, five in that there is currently an unimproved city street that is on one side of this residence. Part of that city street was um, dedicated to other property owners in, in other sections of that street. Um, Y'all deeded those over and closed those sections on part of that street in other areas. And my question would be that particular area, it is just a gravel drive now and not an improved street. And if this is to be approved, whether or not that has to be brought up to city street specs and whether or not the setback required by those would affect the structure even more than what it already does and whether or not those could be worked around to allow them to do what they would like to do. Um, number four would be the use of the residence for its intended purpose um, and the ability that will be afforded to the applicant to transfer approvals of zoning to different ownership entities or, or in the future. Uh, at the meeting, there was an individual who owns the property that was applying for the rezoning in their particular name. Uh, they intended that their use for the property was to use it as an extended stay type facility um, that would house, I believe, four different uh, rooms. And um, my qu a question was brought up by someone on the, the planning and zoning board of whether or not that, with the amount of money they were talking about spending on a remodel to get it to livable positions where it could not be condemned um, and be granted to CO, whether or not that amount of money uh, that would have to be spent to get to that point would put them in a position to where that type um, business would be profitable and sustainable. And if it wasn't, what was the intentions of that property going forward? There's been a lot of issues with some more free zoning in town um, over the years, as all of y'all know. And, and again, I, while I'm for this concept and, and uh, not necessarily against this particular location uh, individually, um, I do think that if the concept does not work, um, there should be some consideration of the zoning not being able to carry forward to a, to allow for a situation where new construction could be torn down and built back in its existing footprint. There are some variants and uh, conditional permitted uses that uh, can be applied for and have been applied for in the past by other property owners to build structures back in their uh, existing footprint um, as a way of being allowed to do things on a non-conforming lot. And I would just have concerns that if it was granted to be R3, R3 and that it originally intended to use was not able to be sustained, that if there weren't any stipulations to that zone, that they would be able to scrap the idea before it really started, build something in the existing footprint of what's there that was new construction that would obviously more better fit the needs of everyday living and use, but be more affected by the setbacks and all of that. Um, six would be the, again, the possibility of those transfer, uh, those approvals being transferred to different ownerships. Um, there was mention that there could be partners brought on at a later date. Um, and this is more on the application of whether or not the approval for the intended use that they are applying for can be transferred from the applicant to any partners that they bring on for that specific use, um, which I personally think would be fine as long as they were transferable for the intended use. But I, I do think there could be some gray areas if it was transferable and not tied to that specific intended use that's applied for and stated in the beginning. Um, the period of time given to the owners of again making improvements to the property as well as the respective time frame that's given for its ultimate completion. Uh, again, if it was a situation where R3 zoning, which is a, a very hard to come by commodity in the town, is given for a project for one intended use and it's not started and a good faith effort made to produce that intended product uh, and, and make it an, an actual thing that can be of service to the community. 
you know, over a period of time, I, I wouldn't want to see where they just never picked up the ball and actually did what they said they were going to do and wait until uh, it was forgotten or it wasn't something that was being paid attention to and, and we did something else. Um, number nine, um, or number eight, uh, public safety consider considerations that be required if it's um, approved, uh, given the location and its proximity of the residence to the street, um, if construction activities were to take place on the side closest to the railroad, uh, I do believe as someone that's in the construction industry um, would know that there could be a public safety uh, thing in regard to proximity to that street for not only construction workers but for the general public. And um, I think there should probably be a requirement for some type of uh, barrier uh, like you see in bigger cities where they put them on sidewalks and stuff to keep construction debris from falling into the street and the cars and potentially causing accidents or damage as well as keeping cars from being able to just hit an individual that doesn't think about where you're standing and takes a step back on you step into a street and get by a car. Um, and then the final consideration um, would be whether or not their application, if y'all uh, wanted to approve it, uh, applies for everything that they're actually going to need so that they could um, get an approval one time from this board and be able to move forward without having to come back multiple times because uh, one aspect or another that affects the construction of the property was not taken care of in the original application. So I will. Uh, provide this uh, list of concerns to Ms. Frank to give you all, but I just want to be able to read them out loud um, so that y'all could hear them before I went to this other meeting. Uh, I'll leave it to y'all to discuss and vote on the higher you see fit. I appreciate your time. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. I'm yes. not sure this will carry the code enforcement officer. What amount of money did they propose to put in and it's bring it up to the, to the use they wanted to uh, make? Okay. Their estimates at the meeting that I was present in was, memory serves me correct, uh, $225,000 to $300,000. Um, and I may be wrong, but I, I believe it was in that range. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Genius, is this y'all's property? You got anything you want y'all to say about it? I, unless y'all want me to say anything. I mean, I've, I've said it twice so, at the zoning board. Yeah. No, I just want if you want to respond to anything you see. Here, what the zoning board? They are crazy. <clears throat> okay, what's the will of the board? Was there any least concerns raised at that time? Uh, some of the setback concerns was raised. Uh, that's about all I don't remember. Parking is it's room enough. You should be able to get three cars back there. Was any of this been raised to you? Does um, some of that come up in the zoning board? Do you have any concerns about anything that's mentioned tonight? There's a lot there, but I can't. You want two minutes? I can't. Do you want time to review that yeah. before they approve it? Yes, yeah, I will. Do you have a copy of it? I'll get him to send me a copy of that. You got any pictures over here? Do I have any pictures? Of the, of this field of construction? Uh, we might pull some up on that computer right there. On Google Earth. I don't, I don't have any pictures. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, I mm -hmm. will say if everybody will drop by and look at it, you'll know that something needs to be done. And this is the best solution that okay. I've come up with. Mm -hmm. It, it, well, no, it no. is an entrance mm -hmm. to the neighborhood that we've been working yeah. on all these years. And yeah, it's, it yeah. just can't stay like that. Right there.
that was in 13. Be mowing, weed eating, and 
poison and fire ants and things. There's over 5,000 people that's buried in the New Albion City Cemetery. And we've got a lot of graves in there that's not marked, that's unmarked. I mean, old graves, uh, you know, I don't guess their family ever thought to put markers on them. But inside the cemetery, there's over 150 <coughs> individual family plots. You know, maybe like a 12 by 12 or a 14 by 20 or you know, 30 by 40. You know, it's got little concrete walls up about that high. And they never did put no gate to where you can get in there with a the mower, so you have to weed eat all of that on the inside of a lot of those. And you have to weed eat on the outside of the walls, too. Uh, it offers many extreme challenges, uh, challenges such as having to poison countless numbers of fire ant beds in the springtime, especially when it starts raining, fire ants pop up everywhere. I try to keep them poisoned as the best I can. Uh, in the fall of the year, you up there, you fight in yellow jackets. And if you ever got one of those, you know they, they can work you over. Uh, removing fallen trees and limbs, trying to fill in sunken graves. Uh, I noticed down on the lower end here recently, I've started having some sinkholes down there for some reason. I mean, I've had two or three, and I just fill them in, and then a couple weeks later, they've sunk in again, and I fill them in again, and I don't know why they keep doing that. Eventually, you think it, they'd stop. You know? uh, but like I said, it's got a huge majority of the cemetery job is weed eating, uh, picking up trash along the road and out of the cemetery, and weed eating the grass along the road banks, you know, because you can't get a lawnmower up on those banks, and a large majority of that has to be weed eating. This grass gets fertilized pretty heavily. There's a lot of elderly folks that comes in, especially down on the lower end toward Highway 15. They pour the fertilizer to it. I mean, when you mow it or weed eating, it'll burn your eyes and nose. It's so strong. And I was up there a couple years ago. I, I man, it was growing so fast, I couldn't even keep it cut. You know, I'd cut it and then it needed it again. This elderly lady come down there and I told her, I said, I'm trying to keep it cut the best I can. She said, Oh, hon, we poured the fertilizer to this. And I was thinking, you know, you don't need to be doing that because it grows fast enough without fertilizer. But, also with this job, you have the expense of equipment, such as my mowers, and they, they're pretty expensive now. You got the blades, the belts, I've got my commercial grade weed eaters, trim line, weed eater oil, fuel prices, I mean fuel fluctuates up mostly, it hardly ever goes down. Uh, the expense of high price fuel, the expense of the ink poison, I mean ink poison is expensive, and I use a lot of that up there. And even through all of the rising cost of equipment and supplies, I myself have never once came before this board to ask for an increase in pay in 13 years, you know, because I agreed to take it for what I agreed to and I was content with it and happy. Uh, if I've ever been contacted or asked by the mayor or any of y'all or any citizens here in New York about a problem up there in the cemetery that needed to be taken care of. I get right on it. I get it done. I don't wait no two or three days. I don't wait no week. I go right then and try to get a solution to it. But it, it came to my attention that the cemetery was brought up to be rebuilt on. And my question to the board is, is, is why? I mean, have I failed at doing something? Uh, I mean, my, my philosophy has always been if something ain't broke, don't try to fix it. You know I mean, if y'all got problems with it, I mean, you need to let me know. Oh. Why would it need to be rebuilt on? I mean, that's my question, and I, I don't understand it. I mean, the workload up there has increased because of the trees, in which I didn't have no problem with that. Oh. A lot of the ground that I once mowed, now I'm waiting, having to wait eat, and I've never complained about it. That didn't bother me. My biggest question is, is why would it need to be up for rebid unless somebody's got a problem with the way I'm doing it? 
No, I'll answer that. I'm the one that brought it up to be reviewed and made the motion last last meeting. I've had numerous complaints, and it's you do a lot of the work by yourself. You have one other employee. Is that is that right? I got my, my daddy helps me, my son helps me, but on what I get paid, you can't afford to hire no whole group of people up there. I mean, finish finish what you say. Well, like I said, I get complaints. It's it's never all mowed at once. You stay behind all the time. One you be mowed one side and it's knee deep on the other, and then you mow it, and then the other side of it, and it's uh, the amount of money, in my opinion, the amount of money that you get paid have, it should be better maintained. And I had never, you know, up by the road, I went back in the back side of Cemetery. It's not visible from up on the road. And there's a lot of leaves on the tombstone that never been touched. And part of your contract is keeping the tombstone clean, keeping the dead low-hanging low -hanging limbs. You can't even drive through down the road without limbs scratching your vehicle. That, that's in your contract about maintaining room and low-hanging limbs and dead trees, dead limbs that fall. Get that up. And lots in the back is not. It's not been maintained like the contract said. Well, I mean, 23 acres, and, and it's raining every day like it has been. I mean, and I can be honest with you, what I'm getting paid, there's a lot, a lot of places pays a lot more than that for the amount of work. I mean, I, I can I can vouch for that because I've checked around and I know. I mean, you never have contacted me about it. I mean, I'm up there just about every day. I mean, I mean, you know, if mayor calls me about something, I get right on. If anybody comes up there and tells me about something, I get right on. I mean, I hadn't seen no limbs hanging down scratching vehicles. I hadn't had nobody say nothing to me about it. I mean, that's what I'm looking at. I mean, 13 years, and then all of a sudden, bam, you know. I, I, know, I know there ain't nobody in this room still making the same money today that you started out making 13 years ago. Hey, how many acres over at Glenfield? It's, uh, it was one, I think it's like 1.3, isn't it? Less than two. Yeah, it's less than two. Okay. All of it together is a little over 23 acres. Mr. Mayor, I have a question. What is the amount of money that Mr. Uh, all of being compensated to take care of this thing? 40. 40? 40 a year. That includes his fuel and his equipment. Yeah, that's a response for everything. Eight pauses, everything. I mean, my, my opinion, I mean, I've always said if you got a problem with it, come to me, you know. I mean, I never was contacted. Matter of fact, I wouldn't even know about this if I hadn't been called and told by the mayor, but I didn't have no idea. Didn't nobody let me know nothing. I mean, 13 years for the same money, to me, that should be worth something. I mean, if it's not, then that's bad. Because I can promise you, like I said before, there ain't nobody in this room working today for the same money you was making 13 years ago. And that's the way I feel about it. If you can get somebody to do it for less than 40000 I say, go for it. Because there ain't nobody going to do that for less than that, I don't think. If they do, you better get the tractors and the bush hogs ready. Because they'll be up there with them. I mean, honestly, I feel like I've been done dirty. That's my opinion. Of it. That's all I got. Good, thank you. Thanks, buddy. All right, Lauren Green and Terry Reno from Alphalac. That's the way y'all want to talk. Okay, we thank y'all for allowing us to come back and follow up on our um, last presentation. We know it's outside of your open enrollment and playing year. And we had prepared to come back and talk about that you can still um, offer AFLAC outside of the plan year. We can run a short plan year. The section 125 does allow for employees to make a change if there's a new carrier brought in. They think that that coverage is better than what they currently have. So you do still have some flexibility. Um, AFLAC still has some things on the table for you guys, some guaranteed issue life insurance, and then also the free value added service that we had mentioned before. Um, I believe I gave you guys all a book 
uh, that had those seven included. I always kind of opt for the ADD, the accidental death and dismemberment, or the fraud protection. Um, but that's what we just want to follow up on and see if that was something that we could proceed with, maybe for an 8 1 or a 9 1 effective date.
so if Brad says that he will do that, do we need to come back to the next meeting or come up with a different thing at that point? Come back to see us. Y'all okay with them? I think as long as it's going to affect Benji. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So. Yeah, just another option. <coughs> Everybody okay with that? All right. We'll let you know. Let me check the player in a couple of days. Thursday, probably not. Refresher, maybe for some of you, maybe all of you have seen this. You know, you know the, the point in the intersection that we're going to talk about, and I don't know if my cursor yet can be seen up there, but this is Munsford Drive as it comes off of 22 Northwest, Northeasterly, I'm sorry, and it's Bankhead. The red line, if you'll just follow the red line, this is Glenfield inter intersection. So you're all familiar with that very hard left turn for uh, especially semi trucks and uh, my cursor go there again. and also obviously when that rail is stacked up it's really really bad and so has been for many years as the industrial uh, areas uh, north of the, the railway have expanded that's just exacerbated this issue um, and so we, as Mr. Phil had pointed out, we, we've been in search of a, not only a, a right fix for that, but also looking for potential funding for that. And early on, we were looking at Tiger Grants, Tiger Grants or federal funds that uh, you all may be aware of. They were an 80-20 match. That, was continued for a number of years, Tiger 1, 2, 3, 4, see, you know, all the way 
uh, through uh, 11, I believe. And then last year they renamed it and they, they called it the Bill Grant. And I'll tell you that acronym, what it stands for a little bit, but um, what, along with that came a, a greater emphasis on rural areas. Not only the amount of funding nationally that was set aside for rural areas, but also a relaxation of, of the, uh, the match amount made this project more feasible. Um, so I'll just, without further ado, kind of go through this slideshow. Uh, you can, before I do, just as, as a broad brush, the red section obviously gets you back to Sam T. Barkley. Um, what we think is the best option is beginning uh, here on Munsford, not far after this ramp, get outside of the MDOT uh, interstate right away, excuse me, and we start uh, going with an elevated section to go over Bankhead and then uh, also over the rail, keeping in mind that there may be an expansion of that rail. We, we've been in contact with Burlington Northern and MDOT uh, to, to try to get some early uh, ideas of how far we would need to do this. But we would, we would propose to ele continue that elevated section, a bridge, if you will, all the way over Rolling Hill Drive. And that would, so that would make us a, a safer area for that, that residential population that seems to be growing in that area. So it come down, keep losing come down to an, an at grade section right in here and then meet and improve this uh, th this intersection here at Sam T. Barkley. So well, I guess it jumped on up there. This is a traffic count. Uh, yeah, I know you can't see the numbers very well, but I'll tell you that this is 19,000 and something on the interstate. It's 7,400 right there. So a little over a third of traffic is coming through there. It's that's the vehicle in 24 hours. That's right, that's ADT, that's average daily traffic uh, as, as uh, projected by MDOT's counts. This comes from their website. This is just a color-coded snapshot of, of industries. And some of them you, you may not be able to see in the color, but you'll, you know, just this, this slideshow, we tried to uh, develop this so that we could show it to you all, uh, legislators, people that would be uh, stakeholders or, or decision makers in that funding process because it is a federal uh, grant. So um, but we try to do some pop and wow about, hey, this is a lot of industry up here. And there's also the elementary school right here. So there's uh, see if I can proceed on. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of this, <laughs> but I will go through the, uh, the, the brief overview and benefits. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a west side connector for all, uh, industrial, residential, and school users to I-22 and beyond. Uh, it eliminates that three-stage, really gapped access that we were talking about, that uh, intersection that it would eliminate that at grade rail crossing. So not just the, if the rail crossing weren't there, you know, it's still kind of an odd place for a lot of that traffic to get through. But so that's really two different points that it would uh, it would improve. Um, and I, I'm just going to, if y'all will allow me, uh, please feel free to ask questions anytime. But I'm going to jump through this because this was intended to be a longer PowerPoint. I don't want to bore y'all, but. I have one quick question about the rail crossing. If this were to come to fruition, will the rail crossing at, uh, or do you know if the rail crossing at Glenville would be done similar to what they did out in front of the old tutorial? So would they eliminate that? There would be a discussion between the city and Burlington North, I think, about where, whether to close that completely. I mean, it's signalized right now. Just take a lot of. If you took the amount of industrial traffic away, that this would, it, you know, it might be feasible to leave it in. But I, I do think they would. Burlington Northern um, would want to request probably 
including some of the smaller crossings, just to the east. But that's pretty important for those residential areas in that immediate area. I think it's pretty important. Right. Um, these are just some estimates. Uh, and again, these are preliminary. So as we go through further discussions, if you all uh, approve us to proceed, we, uh, some of these may change, but these are at 1,400 feet of uh, uh, at grade roadbed construction and it's 2,400 linear feet of elevated bridge function. Uh, miscellaneous features. There are obviously challenges on the engineering front. There are challenges on the permitting front. Uh, utility relocations or look like they're not as, as many as some other routes, you know, that, that could be. Let's go back to that previous slide. Sure. So, so abandoned rail crossing in Bluefield Road? Well, yeah, that's that's an early thing. That should be a question mark there. Okay. So, thank you for pointing that out. That's one of the issues of that being determined. Uh, other challenges, obviously, right away at easements. We think those are fairly minimal. There's some businesses uh, between the rail and Bankhead that have to be addressed. There's a parsonage, obviously, at the church there that would be impacted also. Uh, item E here, funding challenge. Uh, this is what we have. This is just a broad brush look at right-of-way easements and utility relocations. You can apply for those under the bill grant. They really strongly this year uh, emphasizing local participation funding <coughs> in some degree. So, uh, in, in fact, what it's, how it reads is that the Secretary of Transportation, it's called an 80-20 match, but the Secretary of Transportation can waive that 20 you know, reduce that 20 local match. You just have to a little bit more into the application side requesting that, which we would do, obviously. Um, planning, engineering, design, <coughs> by the field grant, procurement construction of the project through the field grant. And I, look, it says 100%, potentially 100% federally funded for those, op those items. Uh, we don't know until we get through that, until, until they make their selection. The bill stands for Better Utilizing Investments to Leverage Developments. And that's just some snippets about the particular grant this year. And um, so this is a part of the flyover that you'll see a little bit of a video. This is a snapshot of it. So, see if I can, here we go. This is coming off the interstate over the left uh, side and, <clears throat> excuse me, starting that elevated section. And so we try to uh, look at future growth potential of all this area and not impacting it with an at grade section. So you, could, you still have some options there to expand that roadway that goes through there or, or tie them to it, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and then obviously coming back down to grade before Sam T. Barkley. This is another view looking uh, westerly, no, looking easterly. This is the interstate right here off to the right. So this is the, the proposed roadway going north. Uh, and then north easterly. All right, so to meet the grant uh, criteria, there are eight merit criteria. And I will provide these if y'all want these. These come from my narrative that I've started. I believe that this project um, has a, meets all eight merit criteria. And so these are different. I'm going to go through the, the first one. Safety is obviously the, the main thing that uh, the public would be uh, benefited from. And 
that is the elimination of that intersection, that at grade crossing, uh, improved safety at the elementary school traffic, industrial traffic, residential traffic. And this third bullet point right here, vastly improved emergency response times. That's a, that's a big, you know, for that area. And not just currently, but in the future. State of good repair is, is one bit. Um, we believe it takes traffic, obviously, off of the other interior roadways, smaller roadways. Uh, your maintenance costs on those 20 years out. You know, there's a certain amount of math to do to, you, you improve those uh, maintenance numbers by taking that traffic off. Economic competitiveness. Obviously, there's the industrial park there. There's also the industrial park down in Marktown area. And then the county, I think, is starting some, you know, market some areas down there, too. And so it's, that's on the south side of Munsford. This connects those two. Beyond that, it is a, if you consider Sam T. Barkley as a better route than going through uh, town for some, some areas, it really connects highways 30 and 15 uh, to each other in a better industrial route. So uh, those are all part of that. Quality of life, some of these are seem redundant, but they really are the same thing. Quality of life is, is very, you know, similar to some of the safety issues. Um, safety of the residents by the elimination of that crossing, for instance. Uh, improved commute times. Those are things that would, would occur. Uh, not just for emergency response time, folks, but also for uh, folks going to work, you know, industrial traffic. Employees. Um, so it really opens the area to improve economic growth, which in turn en enhances quality of life. Um, these uh, last four are now, and this, this year is considered secondary um, merit criteria, but we think they need that also. Uh, environmental protection, obviously, uh, the, the time that traffic has to idle there, both vehicle traffic, and those to traffic as well as the rail. Uh, slow times, delay times for the rail because of that intersection, because of uh, how they have to slow down at that crossing. Um, even a few miles per hour improves that greenhouse gas uh, that's deposited there. So uh, innovation, that was really the hardest one to, to maybe put into a narrative is the innovation portion of this. So what we're going to do is just really rehash. Hey, we're, we're making all these improvements. It's, it'll, it's a natural route, more natural than what's there right now, or more seamless than what's there right now. So uh, number seven, partnership. Uh, we we. Obviously, this, this intersection, this is in the city limits. Um, so we would, you know, you, you'll always be the applicant for this. Um, Union County has expressed their interest in obviously supporting this in every way they can. Um, Mr. Phil has, through the years, uh, captured a lot of uh, support from, letters of support from legislative folks as well as the industrial uh, users out there and also the residents that are there. So there's probably what, 250, 250 different signatures. Have you got those letters from the school? Yes. And we had, in those situations where they didn't feel comfortable asking for letters, uh, we just did surveys and had them sign up on those. So we have several hundred Signatures. <laughs> uh, we have contacted the DOT. We would like to contact MDA uh, as well as NMIDA. Some of these you know, Three Rivers we've talked to, uh, and also TBA. Stevens was one of the ones that uh, was instrumental in this beginning of this. Burlington Northern. Santa Fe Railroad. So we've got their 
verbal, if you will, in an email, but we really need a letterhead from Burlington Northern. Uh, obviously, this improves everything about what they do in that area, in our opinion. Uh, you know, they're going to come back with, you know, all kinds of uh, cons about it, I'm sure. But um, but to elevate over them, there's a certain permit process you have to go through. It's a different function of the order that we'll have to uh, different division. So the, uh, the eighth merit criteria is a long name for local funding to match is really what that is. And so what's already occurred that we can put a number on is previous studies of planning by uh, Union County Development Association. Sorry about that, it's misspelled. Uh, there are some environmental due diligence costs that we think would be uh, instrumental for the cities and counties and want to go ahead and, and, and look into. From, uh, as a result from talking to Mr. Field, we've got some ideas from environmental firms about what that might cost. Uh, so that's a good one because it gets you ahead of some of the other uh, applicants in our opinion that are not there yet. Hopefully. Assistance with future right-of-way negotiations and purchases. These are things just for you all to think about. Now there is, a, there is a component of the bill grant that might pay for those two. Purchases. Um, assistance with utility relocations. Those are some areas that we would like to put in as a narrative as the city is, you know, city, county, city, county, UCDA might uh, participate in. So, discussions, comments, questions, and I also want to, if you can help me, get this uh, video. Mr. Jones, I don't know if I can do this. We're on his computer. While they're setting up, let me just say that we're not here to ask you for the $24 million that this is going to cost. What we'd like to do tonight is to get a commitment that you would stand behind about $6,000 of environmental studies. Now, we're not going to ask you to pay for them unless this grant comes through. We won't do them unless the grant comes through. But it will look good in this narrative if we say that the city is willing to support that, how much was it, six thousand dollars? It, it ranges from uh, right about ten, and there there was a high estimate too around. 40, but that was so for the whole thing. That was for all. Of it, right? That, that for portion all of it. that we'd like to get you about six thousand dollars, which includes phase one environmental site assessment, wetlands, uh, remediation, uh, cultural and more historical resources. <coughs> Endangered species. Those studies right, would be included in that ten total. Yeah. Yes. Is it six thousand or is it ten to forty? It's ten to fifteen. That's the whole package. Yeah. The whole package right. of those four. Do you have an estimate, a range on the total cost of this? Yes. Of acquisition so, of land, engineering, legal, construction, so forth. What is and, that? Like? And obviously, these are these are preliminary. Uh -huh. A lot of it's going to ch could change with comments from Burlington Northern as well as the MDOT, but uh, the, the whole cost would be in the range of 24, well, I say the range, 23 to 24 million. Um, and the max that the bill grant will allow you to, uh, to apply for is 45 million. So it's a good project for, you know, in our estimation. Obviously, they're going to try to spread that money out, you know. Um, but that's our our preliminary, very preliminary. Estimate. You're saying the maximum would be maximum cost today's cost for 24 mil estimated. Estimated. So, and if it's a lot of 10 years out before it's finished, we don't know what that's going to be. It, if, if you get approved by this 2019 grant, you uh -huh. have to be complete with the construction by September of 2021, September 30th. So it's a short time. It is. So we be making years. commitments very quickly. Yeah. When, when we apply for it? Now? 
we had to fly for it by July the 15th. July 15th. We had a month. They released it in middle June. Yeah. Yeah, their notice of funding opportunities came out. So this commitment of six thousand is that city and county split or, or no? That's other? city. But it, but there's no other funding. I and mean, you said it was the range from ten to fifteen. Where's that other money? He explained to me ten. that there are multiple segments of this. For if we could get a commitment on the first one, the environmental study. That's what the six thousand. That's the six thousand. If we could get a commitment on that, not a dollar, but just a commitment that if the twenty-four or twenty-five million comes through. That that part of your participation really can be guaranteed. So those studies are done until the commitment We have to would have to be creative in our narrative to say that that was you know that he was. y'all had to ready to do that. Because we don't we wouldn't have time if you said here's the money go do it today. We couldn't have it done until about the 15th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we can say that we're looking at that and that you're committed to continuing the process and i think it'll go a long way to it yeah it meets that eight criteria of some funding participation my name is what are we talking about the best thing <clears throat> if the project's 24 million i mean what would what would our what are we committed we, to tonight we, we, we to well just the, the first phase of the, the environmental is that the six thousand that's a good thing. They know faster for that. You didn't have to commit to that. That's only if you get the grant. The 24 million. Good for you, Trey. Um, I have one question about that. Um, who would be responsible for maintenance of that road? How does maintenance work with the city? Right. Well, well, that's one of the reasons we wanted to elevate as much as possible because there's a lot less maintenance in the elevated section that you have to have for There's no water running under that bridge, so it's not going to get washed out. Do we think that the future revenues, I guess you'd say, the, the growth that it would provide would probably also make this, but it would be something that the city would probably be to what think about. One thing that hadn't been said, when Toyota came and we were interested in tier one suppliers, and when they came and looked at Glenfield, they said no because they won't cross the railroad track. If they're tier one, they cannot be on the railroad track separating them. There's a lot of land up in that area that has not even been touched with development. You know that up there, all that grassland. Ten years from now, if that influx happens like it did in Georgetown, where are we going to put them? It's an ideal location. And, and this project goes <coughs> to Sampton Barkley and stops. Yes. That's where the project ties in there. Where the, the, the curve that is to go to Taylor's. Yeah, yeah bring that curve. The table table. curve. Yeah. Because, I mean, you're talking yeah. about your point of getting from Highway 30 to Highway 15 is a very good point that, and what you're talking about right now, is past this project. Yeah, that was one of the the first comprehensive plan that was drawn up. That was one suggestion. You remember that? It's, that was called an interlude to connect 15 over to 30 west. That was one of the things they had recommended. And that's a, really the only spot we got left to do that. I mean, the thing that would be a concern is the school being there, and then 10 years from now, that's not that road that it is right now, it's a four lane, you know what I mean? Highly traveled road. Going by the school. High school's on the four lane highway right now. No, I mean, I, yeah. I love the idea, so I, I just. Yes, it, it uh, you know, I think. If you look at the long term 20.